strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Show away my sin, 
away your sin if you're watching online what can wash away your sin nothing but the blood of Jesus oh Lord Jesus we thank you for your precious precious blood that cleanses us that makes us righteous in your presence, that we can come into your presence, into your holy presence. And as we sung in that earlier song, in your presence, all my fears are washed away. So Lord, your blood washes our sin away and your presence washes our fears away. Well, that's why we need to be in your presence. That's why we need to be reminded of your precious blood because Lord there's a world bombarding us with fear and with lies with all sorts of stuff Lord when we come into your presence we are reminded of the power of your blood to wash away our sins the power of your presence to wash away our fears oh we thank you so much for that Lord Jesus take your seats for a moment and um, we're going to have a couple of announcements and then back to the team great to see you all if you come in just after we start it great to see those joining online also uh, thank you for being with us this morning a couple of announcements Tuesday evening uh, Bible study will be on zoom we're going to have the little link sent out again just every Tuesday some of you were unaware that the link that you have had is the same link it's not a special link every week it's the same one does one size fits all does the prayer does Tuesday night and I know some of you had put them in your bin and all the rest so uh, we will send out that little link to remind you but if you don't get it and you have an old link it will do to get you onto zoom so don't don't panic so it's uh, 7 30 on Tuesday evening continue with our bible study to 2 p.m on Thursday prayer and then next Sunday our water baptismal service Ooh. Four weeks in a row, I've had a woo. 
We could maybe have a woo woo. <laughs> I'm not looking forward. I'm freezing in church. I'm going to be standing water for half an hour at Bally Kindler. Duh. Got a wetsuit. Just being smart. <laughs> Play with the head, keep the feet for dancing, as the Bible says. And so uh, we're so looking forward to that. We will be late. Now, I want you to listen very carefully because I'll say this only once. I'm actually going to say it twice because you don't listen. We will be leaving, so for those of you, first of all, for those of you who've signed up and who've been passed, because this is a private beach, and as you know, we've had to give your details, get you passed in case you have a criminal activity or your car's dodgy or whatever it is, but thankfully everybody passed so far, even Austin. <laughs> Austin was panicking because he was from somewhere else. <laughs> and uh, But anyway, if you've given your name, you're you're in so far. And uh, so that's good. So if you have given your name and you have been on the list, you can, you'll be able to go next week. So what I'm suggesting is because we still have to practice our social distancing, although it's outside and, and all the rest of it, we have permission to do this, uh, let's put it that way, because it's under religious service banner. And so there's quite a number of people going. And so we, do, we need to be in our family groups. We need to be in our bubbles. And so what we're suggesting is that we bring a picnic, and that means we can stay in our little groups and socially distance now, what I don't want you to do, what do I not want you to do? You don't know yet. Yeah, I see you're listening. I don't want you to decide we'll be leaving church here just after, directly after church. I don't want you to decide, oh, I'm going to nip out to Marks and Spencer's and get some sandwiches now. Because we're all going together because we all have to go on to the beach together. And so if you're not there, if you're 20 minutes late, you'll not get in and you'll have driven 45 minutes and then you'll hear everybody enjoying themselves. And then I wish I had listened. It'll be like the, those who had the lamps and they didn't buy the oil. <laughs> buy the oil, buy the sandwiches, bring a flask of tea, bring whatever you're going to drink. So what are we going to do? We're going to bring our sandwiches to church. We're not going to go from church via some fancy place we get sandwiches and then try and catch up with the rest of the team. We need to be there together. Sorry I'm laboring this a bit, but I don't want you to be disappointed. And I know how disobedient you are. It's taken us two weeks to get all the names when I said, look, we need your name by tomorrow. A week later, we're still trickling in. Anyway, I know my sheep and they don't hear my voice. <laughs> so bring your sandwiches because we'll maybe be there to three, half three, four o'clock and you will be starving. And so we'll go, we'll have the baptismal service. Let everybody who's getting baptized get dried off and warmed and then we can have our nice cup of tea or coffee and a sandwich or whatever. Val's going to lead us in some worship. It's going to be a great afternoon. But to make it work, everybody has to go with the flow. And to get in, we all have to arrive there together and go in together. So just to, what do I have to do? I have to go in together. Okay. And uh, so someday I'm quite sure it's going to be doing something different. But anyway, <laughs> surprise me, please. So that's next Sunday. Uh, I say those of you who are getting baptized, you've got your little bits of paper with all your information. Don't forget to bring a change of clothes and two towels and all the stuff we talked about last week. If you still have to get your little video done, please see Austin uh, today. Some of you are doing them today and some will arrange them over the next couple of days. I think those are all the announcements. Lindsay, can you think of any other announcements? I didn't tell anybody off or I was nice about it. Ish, okay. Anyway... We're going to continue to worship, and uh, thank you again for those of you who are giving online. The bucket will be at the door on the way out if you're a cash giver, and the little envelopes there if you're a taxpayer also. Thank you so much. Let's stand again as we continue to worship. Thank you.
That's our hope. We don't serve a God, a dead God who's in a tomb, but we serve a resurrected, living Savior who the Bible tells us is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us, praying for us every day. If I forget to pray for you, 
you forgot to pray for someone, if you forgot to pray for yourself, Jesus is praying for us. The Bible says not only is Jesus praying for us, the Holy Spirit is making intercession in us and for us and through us. None of us are being neglected in the prayer department. Because Jesus and the Holy Spirit are continually lifting us up before the Lord, before the Father. And so, Lord, we thank you for your precious blood. Lord, this theme this morning that we've been singing about, reminding us of your atoning blood that sets us free, that cleanses us, that delivers us from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and one day will deliver us from the very presence of sin. Amazing. May those amazing thoughts resonate, settle on our hearts today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, let's show our appreciation to the team again. What a wonderful choice of songs again. If you're going out to Kids Church, you can go out. And if you're going out with the youth also, you may uh, head in that direction. Have a great time. As you know, if you have been joining us on a regular basis, we have been looking at the Holy Spirit, and, and then the Holy Spirit is the strengthener, and then we've been looking at individuals, and so we've been looking at uh, Joseph, and uh, the story of Joseph is an, is an amazing story, that whole family tree, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph is one of the sons, and we saw how Joseph was a favorite, and uh, so many things, we saw just the whole complications, one of the most complicated family circles, Do you think your family's complicated? These people are complicated. And we'll actually see another one of those little twists today as we go through the story. And so we're going to continue through the story in Genesis 37. Last week we talked about, uh, Joseph went through many tests. And so last week we talked, uh, first of all, we talked, we talked about the obedience test, how he was obedient to his father. Even though he had this amazing dream, even though he had this amazing vision of what God wanted him to do, when his father told him to go and do some simple task, he obeyed. Then last week we looked at the pit stop or the pit test. Here he is in the pit. He's still in the pit. We haven't got him out, but hopefully we'll get him out of the pit before 12 o'clock. And, uh, but he, today's test we're going to look at is the bad, the from bad to worst test. You ever been in one of those situations where you say, well, at least it can't get any worse, and then it gets worse? Anybody ever had that experience or just me? I think most of us, if you've lived any length of time, you think, well, at least I've hit the bottom now. Can't get any worse, and then it gets worse. Well, this is sort of a little bit of the story today. So we saw Joseph had a great fancy coat. We saw that the betrayals and trials, temptations that lay ahead of him were preparing him, actually, and strengthening him, strengthening his character for the job that God had for him to do and to fulfill his dream. And so sometimes we're going through stuff that we think is just icky stuff, stuff that we hate, and yet God is doing something in our character, preparing us for that. We hate those times. We hate that stuff. But actually, when we look back, we think, wow, God, you did something in me that was amazing. We saw that uh, when they saw him coming, his, the father, his father sent him to find out how the boys were doing. We saw that when they saw him afar off, they conspired to kill him. They said, here comes this dreamer of dreams. We'll put an end to his dreams. Reuben, Reuben had a heart as one of his brothers. He said, when Reuben heard the plan, he genuinely tried to help Joseph. Let's not kill him. We don't need to shed any blood to be free of him. Let's cast him into some pit here in the wilderness. We don't need to lay a hand on him. Reuben thought perhaps he could secretly come back later and get Joseph out of the pit and take him home to their father before any more harm came to him and the brothers agreed. So we see Reuben's heart in the midst of this. We saw that there are several dynamics taking place in the story. God is working on strengthening Joseph's character, as we've said already. The spiritual law is operating in the background unless a, a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abides 
alone and, and Joseph's dream was dying and becoming God's dream in him. But in the background, God is actually planning to save the whole world. And so you're going through some stuff maybe in your life today and in this season and you think, I don't know what's going on here. I didn't sow this. I didn't do this. But my life seems to be full of problems. Maybe God's doing something, preparing you for something that when you look back will be saving your sphere of influence or bringing salvation with a small s to the group of people that God is calling you to and who you're in connection with. We saw that they ripped his robe off him. That was a security blanket, a self-esteem. All the things that gave him worth were ripped from him. We ask ourselves the question, what's our robe? Is it our bank account? Is it our good looks? Is it our education? All these different things. They cast him into the pit. We saw that was stripping away our pride, our self-reliance, our ambition, our plans, our dreams. When you're in that pit that has no water in it, there's absolutely nothing you can do. It's the place where our dream dies and becomes God's dream in us. It's the place where we can only look in or look up. When you're in the pit, there's not a, it's not a great view. You can only look inward and you can look upward. It's a place of self-examination. It's a place of looking to God. So that's where we finished last time. That's a little quick summary. But unbeknown to Joseph and his brothers, God has the next phase of Joseph's journey just around the corners, just about to appear on the horizon. In the midst of all this, God is still in control. And so sometimes in the midst of our journeys, in the midst of our pit experience, we think we've lost, we have lost the plot and God has lost the plot, but actually God hasn't lost the plot. And that's the good news. And we're going to see that as we continue on then this morning in Genesis 37. So just picking this up then, it says, then just as they were sitting down to eat. Here's the great news when you're in the pit. There's always a then. I can't walk about too much here because I'm going to walk about too much, the cameramen all, because if there's a big thing up here to my right-hand side with these slides, I'm boxed in this wee very tight space. It's really hard for me because I like to walk about when I'm preaching. But anyway, then just as they were sitting down to eat, here's the good news. There's always a Kairos moment. There's always a then moment. There's always a time when God intervenes. Here they are. They think we've put them in the pit. We've decided what we're going to do with them. We're going to kill this streamer. We're going to do X, Y, Z. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming towards them. See, it wasn't going this way or that way or the opposite way. It was coming towards them. God had them in his sight, in sights, but actually had Joseph in his sights. They were just in the middle somewhere. God had a plan. God had a purpose. God had somebody coming who was going to bring deliverance. So then, just as they were sitting down to eat, these guys are heartless, aren't they? They're throwing their wee brother, throwing the brother down the pit, and they're now they're sitting down to have a feed. You would think they'd have lost their appetite, wouldn't you? But anyway, this, is, this tells you a lot about them, just these little things. So coming towards them was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah, and here's Judah, he's an interesting character. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Just before we go on to the next wee bit, they said, so what would we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. J Judah has two issues here. Number one, they're going to have to start telling lies. He's looking at the whole consequence. We're going to have to cover up the crime. So he's realizing he's going to become a criminal. Then he's going to have to try and cover it up. Then he's going to have to live with the consequences. But he said, what would we gain? When you look up this word gain in Hebrew, this is to do with profit. King James uses the word profit. How will we make money? What, what sort of financial gain can we make by killing our brother? We would have to cover up the crime instead of hurting him. Let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. And then look how he twists it. Remember we're in Dothan here. Remember we talked a couple of weeks ago that we're in Dothan. That was the place of the religious people. That was the place of custom. That's the place of legalism. Legalistic people are the, they're twisters. They can make the bad look good and the good look bad. Our world's full of them. 
Look what he says. He says, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. Uh, duh, you don't care, Judah. You're not caring whether he's your own brother or your own flesh and blood. You've already spilt the beans in your motivation. You've already shown us what your heart is. Your heart is, can we make money out of him? And I don't want to be caught for a crime. And so you'll have people in your life. So let's, this is, you see, the Bible tells us that these stories are in the Bible for our benefit. These stories are in the Bible, not that we can read a wee simple Bible story and say, well, that was a crazy family. No, these stories are in the Bible so that we can take these principles and concepts and see what happened to these people, the mistakes they made, the right decisions they made, and then apply them when we're in our pit situation, when we're in our bad to worse situation, so that we, if we can learn from their mistakes, we don't have to make the mistake. If we can learn from their wisdom, we can copy what they've done. We can see what people are like. We can begin to understand the motivations of people who maybe are coming against us or who are being difficult. And so some of us will have people in our lives that are twisting the truth against us. Some of us will have people in our lives that can make us feel in our heart we know we're doing what God wants us to do. But they can twist things to make us feel as if we're the body and they're the goody. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been in that situation? You've maybe been in a situation where it's almost like I would call it psychological warfare. You're trying to serve God. You're trying to trust God. You're trying to do the right thing. And yet there's somebody over here, there's a group of people or there's an organization or whatever it happens to be. And they're making you look like the body. It's like a psychological. That's what the, the enemy uses, terrorist tactics. And so here's Judah. Judah has, has released his heart to us. He's shown us his heart. I want to make money out of this lad. I really don't care whether he gets killed or not. I want to make some money out of him. And I don't want to have to spend my life on the run as a convict. I don't want to have to be covering up my crime. But I can't say it that way. Because that looks a bit too obvious. So I'm going to say, after all. He's my brother. It's her own flesh and blood. I'm such a nice person. I'm doing this for your benefit. You ever meet those people? But in here, you know it's not right. You know the motivation's not right. You can't prove it. But this is why we need to be led by the Spirit. We need to discern what's the motivations of people's hearts. We'll see this as we go through the story a little bit more. So when the Ishmaelites came by, as you can see them there, hopefully on the screen, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the pit and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. Very, very interesting. 20 pieces, uh, Ishma, sorry, Ishmaelites. There were 20 pieces of silver and there were Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites, the word Ishmaelite means God will hear. This is a very, very interesting story because if you were to go back 10 chapters, 12 chapters in Genesis, you will realize, if you know your Bible, you will realize that Ishmael was the son that Abraham, so Joseph's great-grandfather, he was promised a child through his wife Sarah, and then they just thought, oh, this is not going to happen. We're going to give God a hand here. Sarah said to Abraham, you sleep with my beautiful 50 years younger Maid servant, whatever she was at the time. Abram didn't put up a big fight from what I can see in the scriptures. And they had a son called uh, Ishmael. And then, of course, when he had, they had the son, Sarah, she was jealous. And she said, let's kick them out. Let's, uh, let's send them away. Abraham didn't want to send them away because he was still his son. But Sarah rhymed on, as only a good wife can do. Kenny, you're laughing a bit too loud there. Can even hear you through that mask. <laughs> she rhymed and rhymed. Get rid of her. Get rid of her. Get rid of her. So the cast her out, and of course she she ran out of food. And so her and the boy, the boy is crying. The child is crying, and crying to God. And God came, sent an angel, and said, "God has heard the cries of Ishmael." God hears your cry when you're in the pit. Of all the people to send, imagine sending the Ishmaelites. 
How ironic that Abraham, who was the father of the promise and the covenant, that the person he threw out would be the person who would come and save the day at this stage. People tell me, oh, the Bible's a load of nonsense. The Bible's a load of numbo, mumbo jumbo. It contradicts itself. It contradicts itself. Did you ever read it? You look at how this weaves through the centuries, through the generations, something that you think is some random stupid thing that somebody did, which it was. God takes it and he weaves it into the story. And Sarah's lack of faith, God weaves it into the story four generations later and uses that incident, the, 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 the generations beyond coming from Ishmael to be the person to get Joseph, save Joseph in this situation. That is mind-blowing. You don't look too excited, but it's very exciting. It tells me that God, nothing is lost in God. Even our mistakes are not lost in God because God will take all things. What does the Bible say? All things work together for good. This is proof of it. So God will hear Joseph's in the pit. The irony of this story is we never hear what Joseph is thinking. We hear what everybody else is thinking. We see their motivation. We don't hear what Joseph says. We don't hear what he's doing. But surely in that pit, he's crying to God, saying, God, you give me this stream. Something needs to happen here because there's no water in this pit. I'll be dead in four days and my dream will be over. Who comes the Ishmaelites? Because God does hear. Not only God will hear, but God does hear. And so in your, in your situation at the minute, your pit experience, your from bad to worse experience, what you don't know is God is hearing. He's hearing your cry. He has the Ishmaelites coming your direction. They may come through someone else. You see, the, the Ishmaelites didn't come and just grab Joseph out of the pit. They came and the brothers and their greed and their wrong motivation thought they were doing something clever. Yet it was God weaved it into his plan the whole time. Incredible. God just blows your mind. God will hear. 20 pieces of silver. 20 pieces of silver is the price of redemption. See, he was redeemed from the pit. What does the Bible says about us as Christians? It uses that terminology. We've been redeemed from the pit. Our lives have been set on the rock, Christ Jesus. Uh, silver is the price of redemption. This is something you may not know, but in Leviticus, uh, I know Leviticus is a favorite book of the Bible for most of you. Um, and so you will know, I don't have to tell you this, you will know that in Leviticus 27, there was, if you wanted to make a vow to God, if you wanted to do something for God, God put a value on, on stuff. He put a value on a house. So the priest would come. Say you say, I want to dedicate my house to the Lord. The Lord would, uh, the priest would come and he would value it like an estate agent. And he'd say, oh, this gift to God, this dedication is worth 100 grand. And then you could, you could go back later on and say, well, I actually, I would like that house back. He said, that's okay. You have to give me a redemption fee of 20%. I'm not making this up. Go and read it for yourself. And so it was like almost in, in, in our current society, we have the minimum wage. So you can't abuse people. You can't take advantage of people. So God put rules in place in Leviticus to protect people, to save people, particularly to do with servants and slaves and vows and things. And so I picked some of these values out that are in Leviticus 27. You can go ahead and read it when you go home after you have your lunch, I'm sure uh, you'll enjoy it. So if, if you're wanting to have a male slave or a servant or, or you're dedicating that person to the Lord, the value for a 5 to a 20-year-old is 20 shackles of silver. And so Joseph the Rackin was 17. So that's why 20 shackles of silver, silver wasn't some random figure that thought up. It wasn't a bidding war. It was, that was the value of a slave, of a servant from the age of 5 to 20 years old. If you're a male 20 to 60 year old, you're worth 50 shekels of silver. If you're a female, there's no equal opportunities in those days. 20 to 60, you were worth 30 shekels of silver. This now takes me to Wimbledon. How come you can play three sets in the women's Wimbledon and get the same prize money as men who have to play five sets? That's not a quality. If it's a quality, play five sets. 
Quality? Oh, quality. Oh, I thought it said equality. Anyway, that's just one of my hobby horses. It's nothing to do with the sermon. It's just a question that I have. If anybody can answer that question, send me the answers in a postcard. It would be most appreciated. So the female 20 to 60 was worth 30 shekels of silver. Now, isn't it interesting? Joseph sold, betrayed, if you like, for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold. He was betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Why was it not 50 pieces of silver? I'm glad you asked that question. See, Jesus didn't have to be redeemed for his own sin. He was paying the price for us, his bride, his church. So a bride is female, if you want to use that terminology. So the price that was paid for Jesus was the price for a bride, was the price for a woman, was the price that we were paid for as the church. Talk about the scriptures being incredible. You talk about the scriptures being linked together. You talk about there's no confusion there. There's no contradictions there. It's woven right through the scriptures. When, when I discovered that, I just thought, Isn't that, that is amazing that the price that was paid for Jesus represented us as his bride. Nothing to do with Joseph, but Joseph, of course, it is to do with Joseph because Joseph is a a prophetic picture of of the Savior, of Jesus, many of the things that happened in in his life. So here we are. Joseph's in the pit. The enemy and Joseph's brothers think they have a plan to kill Joseph's dream. God has the next stage of his deliverance on the way, as we see. God has voices of reason. He has Reuben who has true motivation. Remember Reuben, we read earlier, wanted to go get him out of the pit, deliver him back to his father. He has Judah, who has a false and selfish motivation. And you know, that that tells me something encouraging. God can deliver you from your situation through people that have a good heart and people who have a bad heart. And I know for some of you today, you're walking through some things. Maybe you're watching online. You're walking through some things, and you can identify with this. And you're only looking to the good people to get you out of the the situation. Or you're only thinking God can use nice people, good people, to get you out of the hole, the pit that you're in. God can use anybody. God used Judah, and he used Reuben. One a true motive, the other a selfish motive. Deliverance and redemption is at hand. Another stage of the journey is at hand because you think, well, get out of here, that's the end of the story. Well, you get out of there, that's only the beginning of the story. Now, Reuben hadn't been around when all this was going on, so Genesis continues. Now, Reuben had not been around when the Vara caravan came by, so when he came back to the cistern later and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothing in agony and despair. He went back to his brothers. Reuben says, the boy is gone. What do I do now? What am I supposed to tell father? As the oldest, Reuben is responsible for what happens to Joseph. He was the eldest brother. Does he dare go home and face his father? Listen to this. You think your family's complicated? After sleeping with his father's concubine, he has little chance of being confirmed as Israel's firstborn. Oh, the old sleeping with the concubine incident. We all have one of those, haven't we? You, you know what yours is. If you haven't got one, you are the concubine. Here's the irony. You know who the hunk, concubine was? Bilha. His secondary wife that we read about a few, that was like his stepmother. These are twisted people, and yet God used them. Actually, this, this reading Genesis makes us feel good. It's a bad thing because we, we sort of think, I'm actually not as bad as I thought I was. But then we are as bad as we think we are. That's why Jesus had to. Because if we start thinking that way, then we, we diminish the blood of Jesus and the power of Jesus that we've been talking about today. Because if you miss the mark by one inch, you've missed the mark completely. But still, But don't be too hard on yourself. Some of you are very, very hard on yourself because you think you're the only person who's gone down this road. These people are, they're desperate, aren't they? If you did a movie out of this, you think, who thinks this stuff up? But this is real life. So 
he was concerned about the sleep of the concubine incident, and he thought, I'm going to be disinherited here. The brothers took Joseph's fancy colorful robe, slaughtered a male goat, and dipped it in the blood. Then they took the special robe to their father. Joseph's brother said this, we have, we have found this, this random robe. These, these boys are scumbags. It's the only way you could describe them. And yet, these are the 12 tribes of Israel. If you had them round the back and you asked God for five minutes off, you'd be giving them a kicking. Not very Christian, but... They're not nice, sure they're not. We found this father. Tell us if you think this is Joseph's robe. Joseph's the only man in the country with a multicolored robe like that, specially made, designer made by his, by his dad. Oh, do you think this, is there any chance this could be Joseph's robe? Israel or, or Jacob recognizing the robe. This is, this is my son's robe. A wild animal must have killed and eaten him. Joseph is without doubt torn to shreds. This really caught me. Because I felt, I haven't this in my notes and as I looked over them this morning again. I just felt there are people maybe in here, maybe watching online. And you in your mind have this fear that these people who are in the pit, you're in whatever your circumstance is, I don't know what it is. But you're thinking to yourself, these people are going to tear me to shreds. This situation is going to tear me to shreds. Now, here's what the devil does. So Joseph had this thing. Without a doubt, Joseph is torn to shreds. You're thinking, without a doubt, I'm going to be torn to shreds with this situation. But what does the enemy do? The enemy doesn't argue with you. The enemy doesn't say, oh, no, you won't. They don't say, well, no, hold on. That This is... He, he's alive. They didn't think, oh, well, well, we better tell him. He's, look, he's feeling so bad. The enemy will let you feel bad. The enemy will let you believe the lie. But the irony is sometimes God won't come and say anything either. Sometimes, in, in this whole story, at this stage, God is silent till later on. And so the enemy won't disassociate himself from the lie, but don't always think God has to be speaking into the situation because Joseph already had the word. Go back to the word God gave you. Go back to the season when God spoke to you and keep moving in that direction because God will, will faithfully come through in this. And so then Jacob wailed in agony, tore his clothes with the depth of emotional pain only a father could feel upon losing a child. He dressed in sackcloth and mourned for his son a long time. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. You know, they could have very easily comfort him, couldn't they? All they had to do was tell the truth. But they weren't going to do that. They tried to comfort him. Israel said, no, I will go to the grave grieving for my son. Israel is unconsolable. His grief over his son transcends even death itself. This is how deeply Joseph's father grieved for him. Meanwhile, it's a bit like the then, isn't it? I love how the Bible punctuates the story with these things because these are the things that give us hope. These are the things that help us understand when it looks as if everything's spun out of control. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Meanwhile, back in heaven. Meanwhile, down the road a bit, the Midianites are coming. Meanwhile, God has something planned for Joseph's future. Meanwhile, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. That one word, meanwhile, is an amazing word full of so much stuff. It would be so easy to read over that, wouldn't it? It'd be so easy just to read over that and miss it. Meanwhile, the Midianites, the Mish Ishmaelites, the, the word is the they, sometimes they get called Midianites, sometimes they get called Ishmaelites. Meanwhile, the Midianites arrived in Egypt and sold Joseph to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officers and the captain of the guard. Fran pan into the fire. So the brothers think they have got away with it. To Jacob, all seems lost. Joseph must have thought, at least it can't get any worse. It gets worse. Yet God is strategically placing Joseph. See, Potiphar's not some random person because Joseph needed to be in Potiphar's house to fulfill the next part of his test, the temptation test, 
to get put in jail, to be in the company of the people who had the ear of the Pharaoh. This is a very intricate plan that God has. It's a very strategic plan. It's a very timed plan to the day and to the hour in many cases. And, and so we need to understand sometimes our deliverance is not coming because it's not the time. The meanwhile hasn't come to fullness yet. The then hasn't come to fullness when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Why did the, the Holy Spirit not come half an hour earlier, a day earlier, a week earlier? Because there's a fullness of God. When God says, right, time is ready, God says, right, Holy Spirit, you move. Right, Midianites, you move. Right, Joseph's brothers, you move. Sometimes we don't actually realize we're fulfilling God's plan for a bigger purpose. Strategically, God is placing Joseph in the right place at the right time. Here's something that's very important as we, as we come to an end. We can't always judge what God is doing by our circumstances. If you forget everything else I've said today, remember this. We can't always judge what God is doing with our circumstances. Sometimes our circumstances are good. Sometimes our circumstances are bad. Doesn't mean we're sinning when they're bad. Doesn't mean we're being great people when they're good. But we need to know, we need to be trusting God. We need to know that the it's not about the circumstances. God, circumstances come and go. But people who trust God keep just pressing on, keep marching on. Galatians 6 tells us this as we finish. So let us not allow ourselves to get fatigued, weary, or discouraged. It'd be so easy to get fatigued, weary, and discouraged when you're in the pit, couldn't it? be so easy when, when you think it can't get any worse and it gets worse. You can just say, this Christianity stuff doesn't work. I'm done with God. How many people have done it? But that's not the answer. Let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued, weary, or discouraged by doing good, by responding right, by trusting God, by praying, by reading the word, by saying, Lord, uh, I can't even, I don't even know what to say, but I know your Holy Spirit's praying through me. I've come to the place where I can't even faith it out, but I trust you in the midst of it. At the right time, there it is again. The meanwhile, the then, at the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. Right now, therefore, not tomorrow, not in a week's time, not when we're feeling a bit better. Here's a, a, an act of faith. Something we have to do going against our feelings right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. So what's God, what's the apostle saying here? He's saying, if you want to get out of your pit experience, bless somebody else. So into somebody else's life. You see, it's so easy when you're in the pit. It's so easy when you're in that situation to have a pity party. <laughs> no pun intended. Pity, pit, pity party. Okay, please yourselves. <laughs> so easy to have a pity party. It's so easy of birds of a feather flocking together and all having a moan and a groan. No, the Bible says that that's not going to help you. That's going to actually make it worse. Look for somebody else who's in the pit. Look for someone else who's going through a difficult time. Begin to encourage them. Begin to bless them. Begin to reach out to them. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. As you begin to bless other people, what are you doing? You're sowing into your harvest. You're sowing into their lives. You're blessing them. You maybe are their harvest, but you're actually sowing into your harvest of deliverance powerful because that's what happened with Joseph we see we're going to see as he journeys on he's always serving he's always blessing he's always trying to do the right thing he's always being righteous and then his harvest time comes and so we'll pick it up there next time so let's not allow ourselves maybe the band will I'll just come to be ready let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued weary or discouraged by doing good the right time we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit, right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Amen. Thank you.
Can we stand again? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will feel no
would you put that? I see a light that is coming. What an appropriate song. You know, we don't sit down as teams and, and say, well, you sing that song and sing that song because I'm going to preach in this. You could not have picked a better song to finish after today's message than that song. If Joseph had that song in the pit, he would have been singing that till his throat was hoarse. This is not just a song. This is a prophetic declaration today for some of you. Maybe you're in the room here. Maybe you're watching online. There's a light that is coming for those who hold on. And until that time comes, we're going to praise him and praise him and praise him. We're not going to grumble. We're not going to complain. We're not going to be in doubt. We're going to say, God has told me I'm, I have a dream. I have a word. I have a promise from God for my family, for my business, for my job situation, for my friend, whatever it is. The good news is the light that is coming is not a train that's coming in the opposite direction. It's the angel armies of God. It's the Spirit of God coming to bring us to that place of completion, to that place of deliverance. The then moments, the meanwhile moments are going to be punctuating this journey that we're on until God brings us to that place that He's wanting to bring us to. Maybe we can sing that again. Please, Connor, just particularly uh, the light that's coming and, and to those that hold on. Sing it with everything you have. Sing it as a prophetic promise. Sing it as more than just words in the screen. Sing it as a declaration before the enemy of your soul and before the King of Heaven that you are trusting Him and believing Him in this situation you're in. Thanks, Connor. I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will praise you. Still I will praise you. And I can see a light. never let us go you protect us you shield us, you guard us, you guide us sometimes without us even realizing but we thank you for these powerful concepts these powerful precepts that we are learning in the lives of men and women of God who have journeyed with you many centuries before who've journeyed through difficult times, but Lord, fulfilled their destiny, fulfilled their purpose in spite of their weird families, in spite of bad choices, in spite of difficult circumstances, they pressed through and won the day. 
Father, may that be each of our testimonies here. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.